Good morning, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. It's more early morning here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, so I'd like to say good morning to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lindsay Brown, and on behalf of Beyond Clean, I'd like to welcome you to our second full day virtual conference of 2020. Today's conference is titled Against Biofilm, the Science of Safe Surgical Instruments. And throughout the day, you'll hear from microbiologists, um, patients, and industry subject matter experts who will help you in the fight against biofilm. If you've never attended a Beyond Clean virtual event before, I'd like to call your attention to the small icons along the bottom of your screen. The orange icon with a question mark specifically is for question and answer. After each presentation, there will be a live question and answer session. So during the presentations, I encourage you to submit questions for the speakers um, that they'll address during that session. There's also an icon with a raised hand. Should you experience any technical difficulties, since this is a virtual event, there are suggestions for troubleshooting any issues that, might have, that you might have. Uh, there's also a resources icon that you can click on to access downloadable resources from our event sponsor, 3M Healthcare. Their dedication to educating the industry is the reason we can offer this day filled with education to you for free. Uh, also in that list, you'll find an agenda for the day and instructions for getting your seven CE certificate. Uh, I'd also like to thank our collaborative partner, the Com Credentialing Institute. You'll hear from CEO of CCI, Dr. James Stepinski, at the end of the day. And they're the reason we're able to give nursing credits during these free educational events. Uh, Beyond Clean and CCI have some really exciting projects in the works, which I'm sure you'll hear about more this afternoon. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, grab your coffee. I've certainly got mine. <laughs> or your afternoon tea, wherever you are in the world. And without further ado, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce you to our first speaker, Joseph Staffel, Specialist in Microbiology for 3M Medical Solutions Division. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning to learn about a topic that's really near and dear to me and that I don't think is quite understood as well as I would like it to be from a healthcare setting standpoint, and that is microbial biofilm. Uh, for today's talk, what I'm going to do is give a brief history of the study of biofilm and then really get into the nitty gritty of what is a biofilm and then take a little bit of a left turn and talk about uh, testing of biofilm and antimicrobial claims and how that plays a role. And then I'll finally uh, kind of discuss some ways of how we can defeat and prevent biofilms. So the idea of biofilm may seem like a relatively new topic, but it, it has been studied in earnest since the mid-1970s by who I would consider the father of biofilm, Bill Costerton. One of his first publications came out way back in 1981, where he described when we observe microbes in nature, they typically tend to be encased in what he described as a glycocalyx. But it took nearly two decades for him to come out with this publication that was really the seminal publication that really ignited a lot of study in the uh, realm of biofilms, where he was able to link the, the existence of biofilms to chronic infections. And then we really started to see an increase in the field of study. We started with people really uh, honing and being able to develop techniques to visualize and understand biofilm mechanics we learned that biofilm, regardless of what the microbes present are, that biofilm itself can be a cause of disease. We discovered that biofilms by themselves have their own communication system called quorum sensing, where they share small molecules between them, and then they can tell each other whether or not if they should just hang out or if they should get out of Dodge. We found that, especially in healthcare settings, that if we look Typically, we can find a biofilm. And we also are looking at what is the role of biofilms and what do they play in device reprocessing? And ultimately, now we're getting to where experts are getting together and writing consensus documents about how do we deal with and how do we treat these states where biofilm is a problem. So what is a biofilm? 
And to really understand what a biofilm is, we need to understand the difference between biofilm and planktonic. Now, scientists like myself for over the last century have grown bacteria in labs, in test tubes and flasks as is pictured here to understand them in what, and run controlled experiments. And this is what they typically are in planktonic or free floating forms. But that's not how they exist in nature. The preferred lifestyle of microbes is to exist in a biofilm. They want to attach to surfaces and then they form this slime layer. And this slime layer consists of polysaccharides, proteins, nucleic acids, and inorganic materials, pretty much everything, including the kitchen sink. And I guarantee everybody who's listening out there this morning, you have a biofilm in your kitchen sink somewhere right now. And we call this slime layer the extra polymeric substance. And I'll use it, the acronym throughout the talk, EPS, and that's what I'm referring to. Now, it's this EPS that makes biofilms extremely tolerant to external perturbances like antibiotics and antimicrobials. So a quick poll question, where do we think biofilm is a problem? Navy plane jet engines, food processing plants, oil pipelines, or all of the above? And if you're like me, and if you always see in all of the above, you automatically assume that's probably the answer. And in this case, that is indeed the answer. So we think about where does biofilm impact us in our everyday lives? And it makes sense that anywhere where there's going to be water available, we're going to see issues with microbes growing and forming biofilms. So in the example of cooling towers, where this gets to be an issue is we get these huge scaling events that form on the inside of these cooling towers, which make them a lot less efficient in doing their job. And then these plants end up consuming a lot more energy and expending a lot of time and money and using a lot of caustic chemicals to clean these biofilms away. We see them in issues with paper manufacturing as well, and it makes sense because we have a lot of surfaces and a lot of water available, plus a bulk amount of cellulosic material as a food source. Now, drinking water as our infrastructure continues to age, especially across the United States, and this has happened to me personally in the city that I live, we were one of the last uh, major cities that had not had to chlorinate their water until recently because biofilms were forming in some of the more aged areas of our infrastructure. And you can understand that citizens were not very happy that we went from this nice, clean, uh, pleasant water supply to now a chlorinated water supply. Uh, it makes sense that we also see issues with biofilms in food processing. Uh, but for the most part, our food uh, sources are relatively safe, and a lot of these are under control, and we have really good detection systems uh, for controlling these. Now, when you woke up this morning, unfortunately, no, that film that forms on your teeth, that is a microbial biofilm. But if you have good oral care, you shouldn't have to worry about it. But as for those people who don't have good oral care or maybe don't have access to good oral care, it can lead to diseases like periodontitis and then potentially bone infections as well. We think about from the Navy side, the more obvious uh, issue would be with ship hulls and then all the films and barnacles and things that form on the outside of these boats and ships, and then how they can decrease speed and efficiency and fuel efficiency, things like that as they're moving through the water. But interestingly, when I ran into a colleague at a conference who works in the Naval Labs, she described that one of the projects that she was most frustrated by was she was having these slime uh, biofilms forming on their jet aircraft on naval uh, aircraft carriers. And these biofilms, when they form, they can produce a lot of caustic chemicals, which then can corrode and pit the metal. And when you think about jet engines, that's high precision equipment and any pitting or any defects ultimately will have to be replaced at a you know great time and an expense. Now, I largely just describing where water is present that we have issues with biofilm, but we do see issues with it in the oil recovery uh, as well. So there are oil eating bacteria that exist in the same way that we see our arteries get clogged by plaques and restrict flow. We see the same thing in oil pipelines where these biofilm form on the inside of the pipelines and constrict flow, making the oil pipelines a lot less efficient. And the same way as I described with the aircraft uh, carrier, 
we do see corrosion occurring from the byproducts that these biofilms are producing, which then can potentially lead to catastrophic failures of these pipelines. Now, we're probably all most familiar with how biofilms are with in the medical field, especially with implants when it comes to durable joints and prostheses and uh, catheters, but we also see it in soft tissue issues with wound care as well. So why do we care so much about biofilms? It's because they're really complex and really difficult to treat. So we think about the life cycle of a biofilm. We have planktonic bacteria that come along and then they attach to a surface. And immediately once they attach to that surface, they begin to build their house. They secrete this EPS and they continue to proliferate and mature over time. When times are good, they will continue to proliferate and form more and more biofilm. But as the conditions change to their environment, and that's where things start to change within the biofilm, and this is where the quorum sensing comes in. So if times are maybe a little bit stressed out, they may just hang out in this biofilm form right here and go into kind of a hibernation state. Or if times are really good, they may send out progeny uh, and detach and go ahead and try to conquer more territory. Or they may also detach because they've uh, in, noticed in their environment that there's been some sort of disturbance in the environment that they're not uh, willing to hang around for. So they're going to get out and try their luck someplace else. So if we look at this graphic here, it's a cross section of a biofilm. And this is why how I'm going to describe some of the mechanisms of why they are so difficult to treat, treat especially with uh, topical uh, solutions. So we think of this as the top of the biofilm. We can see we have some planktonic bacteria floating around. And then think about it as if you're someone who suffers from chronic sinusitis. And you get your course of antibiotics from your doctor and you take your antibiotics that are represented in yellow here. So you're going to take care of these planktonic bacteria and a few of the outer layers of this biofilm. And by killing off these bacteria, this may be enough to help your symptoms reside. And you start to feel better, you finish your course of antibiotics, but we really haven't taken care of the underlying issue, which is the biofilm that's sort of hanging out deep in the tissue. But then you get stressed out or you get a little bit run down and the bacteria sense an opportunity then to reform that proliferate and then your symptoms come back. And then we're stuck in this chronic cycle of, of infection caused by a biofilm. So how is this happening? So that EPS layer really slows or can flat out stop the penetration of these treatments from getting deep into the biofilm. And the other thing that we need to take in consideration is what is the mechanism of action of the antimicrobial? So for example, if we're using antibiotics, antibiotics work by targeting very specific metabolic pathways inside the cell. So if the antibiotics, even if they are able to penetrate down into the uh, deep into the biofilm, if these cells are more in a senescent state where they're not very metabolically active, they may not have their pumps turned on and internalizing that antibiotic, and therefore the antibiotic is rendered useless. Additionally, this EPS, and as the biofilm matures, can build up a lot of waste products, which can have a neutralizing effect on the antimicrobials. And what we see is a lot of our topical antimicrobial solutions are cationic or positively charged materials. And this biomatrix or the EPS is filled with a lot of anionic materials, such as free chloride, proteins, and other anionic bio waste products that just build up over time. So the example I'm using here would be silver. Silver is a positively charged ion that also works by attaching itself irreversibly to sulfhydryl groups on proteins, which then gunk up metabolic pathways and kill bacteria. But even if that silver was able to penetrate down into the cells, it's binding with all these extraneous materials and becoming neutralized before it even makes it to the cell. And when we've seen several times when we test silver in the lab versus biofilm, it really isn't that active. Another way that the biofilms are really well suited to existing is that they have these things called persister cells, which really are kind of in a hibernation state. And these cells can exist a few microns deep into the tissue, especially in the interstitial spaces. 
So if you think about someone who suffers from edema and you have this edematous leg where it's retaining a lot of the fluid and now those interstitial spaces are really distended and, and stretched to their max, and you have these wide open spaces for these bacteria to reside and invade, it really becomes a nice place for them to sort of hang out. From a device reprocessing side, I'm a wound care guy, so I typically deal with traditional biofilms. We're talking about surface air, surface liquid interfaces, but when we're talking about devices, we need to understand the difference between a traditional and a potential buildup biofilm. In a traditional biofilm, which is what I've largely been describing thus far, we have a surface and it's typically a surface to air or a surface to liquid interface. In either case, there's probably an aqueous environment that is involved with supporting uh, the biofilm. So think about the inside of, of the lumen of a catheter or a pipe where we have a hard surface, but then there's a continuous flow of fluid flowing over the surface that feeds that biofilm. Or we could think about a surface air interface, think about a chronic wound where even though the surface is the wound, that wound has plenty of moisture there that will also support that biofilm with an aque aqueous uh, source. But from a buildup biofilm standpoint, essentially what we're talking about is starting with a traditional biofilm that gets retained or attached to a device, and then it's exposed to repeated complete drying events. So we have a biofilm that's stuck on a crevice or a crack on a device, it's dried, it hangs out. And one of the, my favorite sort of examples and how it was described to me, and I'm gonna throw my kids under the bus several times throughout my talk is, when your kids eat cereal in the morning and they don't rinse out their bowl and then you come back at the end of the day and that cereal is just glued on to the bottom of that bowl and you have to let it soak or you have to scrub really hard to get it off. Well, that's what's happening here with some of these buildup biofilms is that if they're allowed to dry, they can really adhere and become difficult to remove. And now you have a surface, a biosurface on these stainless steel instruments that now allow additional uh, events of bioretention to re occur. So at this point, I'm gonna take a little bit of a turn and talk about uh, antimicrobial claims and the testing that we do to prove out these claims. So you may or may not know, but 3M conducts a yearly survey globally uh, asking people their thoughts on the state of science. And probably not surprisingly with the environment we're in right now, one of the poll questions that continues to poll very poorly is how scientists like myself communicate their data. So I'm gonna take that cue right here, and this isn't to insult anyone's intelligence, but I'm gonna level set, uh, which is with some basic terminology from a testing standpoint, so we're all on the same page. So just bear with me, and the definitions that I'm using for this slide are ones that I've uh, gotten from my experience with dealing with the FDA and the EPA and how they define these terms. So at a real basic level, what are we talking about? What are microbes? And for the purposes of here, I'm talking about bacteria, yeasts, and other fungi. Now, viruses are microbes, but I will leave that to Dr. Anthony Fauci to deal with that. From bacteria standpoint, we can break them down into two major categories, gram positives and gram negatives. So a good example of a gram positive would be Staph aureus and gram negatives is Pseudomonas. Now from a high level disinfection standpoint, we do a lot of testing versus endospores and those endospores typically come from species that reside in that gram positive category, such as Clostridium or Bacillus species. When we're talking about yeasts and other fungi, the ones you're probably most familiar with from a healthcare standpoint would be Canada species for yeasts, and then dermatophytes like trichophytons. Again, like me, if you have kids at home, especially boys that you might be familiar with, these are the dermatophytes that are most commonly implicated in causing athlete's foot. Now bacteria, we treat with antibiotics. Yeast and other fungi, we treat with antifungals, and there is no crossover between the two. And that is why we need broad spectrum antimicrobials, because they should show effectiveness versus both groups. And ultimately, we prove out that effectiveness by performing time kill assays. And the unit of measurement in these time kill assays is log CFU. CFU stands for colony forming unit. And if you look at the photo on the right hand side there of my Petri plate, 
Each one of those dots is a colony forming unit, and they can arise from either a single cell or a cluster of hundreds of cells. Therefore, we use that catch-all term of colony forming unit. Now, when we perform our testing, especially from a biofilm side, we may be measuring as few as 100 up to a billion cells in a single assay. So therefore, we measure on the logarithmic scale. Saying six log CFU is synonymous with saying one million CFU. Antimicrobial effectiveness is ultimately proven out by demonstrating some degree of log kill. And log kill can also be known as log reduction. So if you're a connoisseur of antimicrobial data, typically that data you're going to see it in bar charts and the unit of measurement is going to be a log reduction value. How we get to that log reduction value is performing assays. So for example, a four log reduction is generated by taking 1 million living CFUs and reducing it down to less than 100 survivors. Now, if this wasn't confusing enough, we can also describe that four log reduction as 99.99% effective. Now, a four log reduction is important from a combination device standpoint, but from a high level disinfection standpoint, typically depending on the method and the claim that you're going for, you're going to need to see six or seven log reduction. Now, when we think about the products that are out on the market today and antimicrobial claims and how they're achieved, it, it can be a little bit difficult. So what I'm gonna describe here first is how we get those claims for combination devices, say like catheters and wound dressings. Now, from the FDA standpoint, they don't recognize any antimicrobial standards for testing to generate these claims. However, they do give us guidance saying, do some quantitative testing and show us some log reduction values. So in the absence of a standard that we can directly run to, we're left with the next best thing, which is methods like AATCC 100, the assessment of antibacterial finishes on textile materials. Now this method was generated decades ago and is largely used for uh, proving the effectiveness of anti-odor t-shirts and socks. Not ideal for antimicrobial wound dressings. However, there is enough information in this method that gives us good guidance on how to perform the testing. But in my opinion, this is where the disconnection really starts to happen because methods like AATCC 100 and others like it from ISO or ASTM call for the use of planktonic bacteria. But if I'm gonna be a developer of a brand new wound dressing and I'm thinking about what do the bacteria in a wound look like in my mind's eye, the picture that comes is not a flask of like E. coli as you see here, but rather the bacteria that are gonna reside in a wound that looks like this. So when I'm developing this product and I really wanna know if it works or not, I should not be testing it versus bacteria that look like this, but rather in models where the bacteria look something like this. So we perform a lot of different assays and each one um, is kind of geared to their own uh, sort of area of expertise. Some environmental, some industrial, some high level disinfection and others from wound. And like, as I mentioned, because I'm a wound care guy, I typically use these assays a lot from a wound care standpoint, but we can modify these to perform them in a multitude of ways uh, to test pretty much anything that we want to. And one method that I wanted to highlight uh, more than anything is the Lubbock chronic wound biofilm model. Now, even though it has this moniker of being a chronic wound biofilm model, I think it really has uh, uses in a multitude of, of areas, especially even if we think about device reprocessing. So what's really great about this model is that we know in nature, biofilms are going to be polymicrobial. They are not gonna be pure cultures like we see in the lab. Um, they're going to be multitudes of, of different strains living harmoniously together. However, when we grow things planktonically in the lab, it is nearly impossible to get things to grow equally or well when we do them planktonically. So for example, if I were to spike a tube with Staph aureus and Pseudomonas, nine times out of 10, Pseudomonas is going to outcompete the Staph aureus and I'm gonna end up with a tube of almost all Pseudomonas. Now with the folks down at Texas Tech here, 
uh, in this model have devised a media system that we're able to grow Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, and Enterococcus faecalis to equivalent densities in a uh, biofilm. What's also great about this model is they've incorporated raw blood products into the media. So when we form these biofilms, we get this really nice fibrinous matrix to form that contains all of the bacteria as well. As you can see, we end up with this really thick biofilm and we can peel this biofilm off. And this is where I think this method could also have uh, some really good implications when we think about device cleaning. Because as you can see, as we remove this portion of the biofilm, we still see a lot of retained tissue and material left behind. Now, if we were to say, instead of performing this on a pipette tip, perhaps we could grow this on a forceps or a clamp, and then also then run this method and determine how well it is cleaning and removing the, the residual biofilm. The other thing that's interesting about this model and what we've been able to do in our lab here at 3M is we've been able to swap out the enterococcus for Canada albicans, making this a multi-kingdom model. So now we have a fungal species also included in this multi-polymicrobial uh, biofilm. And you can see that just as we would see in nature, depending on the organisms that you're using or seeing in the biofilms, you get very different results. As you can see, the Canada has largely taken over from the pigmentation standpoint, and you can see it looks very differently as the Canada typically is a whiter um, uh, cell. The other thing that's interesting about this biofilm with some of the testing that we've done here in my lab is that for a given antimicrobial, when we perform it in a traditional model with this one over here, they may be able to completely wipe out the Staph aureus and have say like a six or seven log reduction in this biofilm. But then once we substitute in the Al uh, Canada albicans, that same antimicrobial struggles to maybe kill one or two logs of the Staph aureus. So just swapping out one organism can lead to very different activity of different antimicrobials. Now moving into the realm of high level disinfection claims, we do a little bit better here because at least now we have standard methods that we can use uh, to run the testing. So we know exactly what we're doing. But the issue I take with these is that even when we look in the name of the method, suspension time kill, these methods largely still are planktonic-like methods. We've upped the game by using bacterial spores, which are very difficult to kill, the most resistant form of life known to man, but we're not really putting them in a real life situation. They are in soils and we treat them um, and coat them onto devices such as these right here, which are called penicillinars. And these penicillinars can be made of different materials like stainless steel or Teflon or ceramics. And they can also be sintered to have holes to where the uh, spores can work their way inside the cracks and crevices. So we can mimic uh, real life conditions that way. But the key piece that's missing here is essentially that organic soil piece. Now they call for the use of a simulated soil, but in my experience, no matter how hard you try in the lab, you cannot replicate the real thing by just combining things in a test tube. And it's interesting, so in the reversal from what we've seen from the combination device side, the FDA agrees that just demonstrating log reduction values of endospores is not really necessarily the best way to demonstrate that you're cleaning a device. It's insufficient to demonstrate that giving us spore count reductions uh, is correlative to organic load reduction. The other thing that I just quickly wanted to point out here is that as great of a material as stainless steel is, it's not infallible. So with repeated cycles of heating, potentially caustic cleaners, and then just general use, stainless steel is susceptible to pitting and cracking. So even though this is a blown up micrograph of the image here to a bacteria, these pits and cracks in here might as well be the Grand Canyon and they're perfect places to hide out. So finally, just to describe a few ideas on how we defeat biofilms. And the primary way we can do that is like, let's prevent the bacteria from attaching to the surfaces. There are a lot of good technologies out there that do use this technique. 
um, and they are very good at preventing the attachment of microbes. However, if these were devices that were implanted in the body for prolonged or permanent use, they're not as good as preventing biofouling from our self cells or host albumin. And then once that device is coated with our own material, now that becomes a surface where the bacteria can come along and then attach. And then we're back at square one. So if we look at the biofilm and what is supposed to be depicted in this graphic right here is that the EPS is a matrix of polymeric strands cross-linked that really encase the bacteria and protect them really well. And one way we can get uh, better effect of our antimicrobials on the biofilms is to break down this EPS, break the bonds, dissolve it, and make the bacteria behave a little bit more planktonic-like. One of the ideas that's been played around for decades is to interfere with the communication system. And there are some technologies out there that are good with breaking down biofilms by doing exactly that, uh, disrupting that communication system. However, that communication system is very specific to typically strains. So for example, if you have a product that's very good at disrupting the quorum sensing of Staph aureus, it's going to be effective, some effective of breaking down a Staph aureus biofilm. However, it may have no effect on the other microbes that may be existing in that biofilm. We can also improve the microbiome. So this is more of a younger area of study to try and understand how do good bacteria prevent the opportunistic uh, ability of pathogens to come in and cause disease. And the one anecdote that I have that I think is the most fascinating is at a conference that I was at, there was a microbiologist who worked at a processing plant for pet food. So in this line, about halfway through the processing line, they were fortifying the pet food with probiotics, good bacteria. And what she found is that routine uh, cleaning and uh, inspection of the lines that anywhere downstream of the addition of the probiotic in that processing line, they had no issues with contamination of pathogenic or bad bacteria, but they could not say the same thing upstream from where the probiotic was added. So this is a great example of how we could do better of incorporating good bacteria, those probiotics, into maybe our own food supplies, especially when we think about the wash water of a lot of our pro produce, that maybe just good bacteria can also prevent just the bad ones from uh, taking hold and forming biofilms and then leading to recalls of massive amounts of food. From the device processing side, it really just boils down to timely and thorough cleaning. Um, like I said, that, that cereal bowl example. So if we can prevent that adhesion, we can go a long way to like preventing any downstream problems with biofilm formation. I had created this slide well over a year ago and it was before the pandemic and really thinking about it, it was the thing I was concerned probably most at the time would be antibiotic resistance and the fact that we're running a little bit low uh, on effective antibiotics, but then COVID-19 came along and really kind of piled on to the idea of here that it really is the microbes world and we're just living in it. Uh, and again, one more comment about my kids when they come up and they tell me, say like they're so over the pandemic and ready to move on, I'm quickly to respond. It's like the virus doesn't care. It's not done with you. It's gonna do what it's going to do. And this sort of is just, these quotes are a perfect example of fortifying that. I'd like to thank my partner in crime, Petra Colaridi, who's been on this biofilm journey with me for about the last 10 years for her help in developing and running a lot of these methods and in pushing me to learn more about biofilm. I'd also like to thank the Center for Biofilm Engineering at Montana State for the use of their graphics. They do a really nice job of generating fat. Thank you very much. And at this time, I would be happy to entertain your questions. Uh, 
All right. Thank you so much, Joseph. That was great information to kick off the Against Biofilm Conference. We're so thankful that you are willing to, to start off the event. We did have some really great questions come through, so um, I'm going to just get right into them. All right. The first one, is it really that important for frontline personnel to understand the science of biofilm, or is it that just important, or is that just important for scientists? Well, I would say it's important for anyone who works in an area that deals with microbial contamination to really understand what they're working with. Um, but it is really a personal preference, you know, like how deep you want to go. I think probably a lot of us could just benefit from the idea that maybe our understanding uh, of microbiology has always typically thinking of it as microbes and test tubes uh, just free floating around and, and for the most part that's just not how they exist uh, they, they exist in these biofilms and they're just way more difficult to deal with so just some basic understanding of how they form these biofilms and like really what is consistent there and how difficult they can uh, be to deal with is is definitely worthwhile in my opinion All right, thank you. Uh, what are some examples of the technologies used to interfere with quorum sensing? And are those chemicals or things like ultrasonic or electrical energy? Typically, they are chemical entities. Uh, some of them, you could classify them maybe as a pharmaceutical or they are small molecule chemicals that typically, the quorum sensing chemicals are small molecules themselves that the bacteria pass between each other. Um, so then those other uh, ones that interfere essentially bind them up or change their conformation so they become unavailable and then the bacteria get maybe a little bit confused and then go in the opposite direction of what maybe that quorum sense of molecule is saying what they should be doing. Okay, great. Um, random question. <laughs> is there a potential place for probiotics in the sterile processing workflow? Probiotic infused pretreatment sprays, uh, probiotic treated cleaning brushes, anything like that? That's a really great question. And part of me wants to say yes, that that does make sense, but it probably really boils down to the, the life cycle of that reprocessing. How long are the instruments going to be hanging out before they, from when they were used to when they're going to be cleaned? If it's a relatively short time cycle, probably not worth it. But if it's going to be something that's like maybe over four hours, um, potentially that could uh, have a benefit. The other issue I could see though, is when we think about it from the regulatory side, pretty much they just want all microbes gone, just no microbes present at all. So I, I really doubt that it would be something that um, probably would take off anytime soon until maybe our understanding of probiotics gets to be a little bit broader. Okay. <clears throat> Next question, have you ever studied the use of enzymes in disrupting the EPS? Yeah, and enzymes can be very good at disrupting the EPS, uh, depending on, again, what else is present in that biomatrix. Um, and uh, the kind of, essentially, they're, they're, uh, how fast they react. Uh, if you have a system that's really powered well, that uh, it can be very good at breaking down. However, that enzyme typically isn't going to, by itself, do anything to the bacteria. It could make, break down that uh, enzyme or the biomatrix very well, but then there'd, you probably need some sort of secondary action to take care of the bacteria. Um, but if it's going into cleaning, maybe that's not necessary. All right. Next question. Do you think biofilm should be a key concern in occupational health and safety issues, for example, in a factory canteen or dinner and kitchen rooms? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and as we kind of continue to expand our knowledge in the realm of biofilm, there's actually a really good um, kind of start to understanding what we call dry biofilms. So yeah, I mentioned that typically we see a lot of biofilms forming, obviously, where there's a lot of moisture available. But interestingly, I mean, bacteria are pretty resilient and, and they will form just about anywhere. Uh, so 
even in areas where it may not seem like a wet environment, but there is organic material food sources available, these bacteria in certain types can really sort of take hold and hang out. Um, but for the most part, I think humans ourselves that when we're relatively healthy can handle a lot of that environmental contamination. But if left unchecked uh, over time in areas such as you just mentioned, uh, it just maybe takes that one instance where somebody comes in contact with it where it could be issues. Uh, so you think about general cleaning, you know, I kind of use those all over, over the counter wipes that we use and we, you know, and I'm guilty of it too. And we just use them to wipe down our surfaces and our kitchens. Um, we probably don't read the instructions as well as we should, because if you look at, read the instructions on there, the claim they may say like reduces 99.9% .9 of the bacteria. But if you keep reading a little bit further, that's if you leave it in contact with the surface for at least 10 minutes. And like I said, I'm guilty of it. I know I'm not wiping my counter down for 10 minutes. Um, but you're right, if we think maybe a little bit harder, if it's a biofilm that's present, it probably is going to take maybe a little bit more effort. Uh, we, should, we should be thinking about it. All right. <clears throat> Many healthcare providers, nurses and doctors, don't have a clear idea of what biofilm is. What recommendations do you have to spread the word? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, what would be great is if maybe we did a little bit better job right away um, with the education right away. Like when, when you're in school um, and you're taking, you know, your basic courses, you know, like I said, if you take your micro 101, a lot of that is going to be based on planktonic uh, sort of, you know, ideas and, and methodology. Um, and in biofilm, you may be left to kind of have to find it uh, on your own. But uh, I think as we are right now, you, you need to, you know, do courses like these, uh, maybe attend a, a conference uh, that maybe has a little bit more of a biofilm, uh, at least portion to it. Uh, and there are just, there's a lot of good information out there on the web. Uh, you know, you don't want to insult myself or anybody else, but there are some pretty good uh, papers out there that are essentially biofilms for dummies. Uh, some biofilm 101 to describe the, the existence of it in certain areas. They're available if you just go ahead and search. And I think a lot of them are open source uh, that you should just have uh, access to them. Okay, great. Um, next question. Does the steam in sterilizers, um, let's see, the steam in sterilizers penetrate biofilms and kill the bacteria within it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and just like anything with any sterilization cycle, it really just comes down to cycle time and the level of contamination. Uh, so, but steam is very good uh, uh, sterilant, um, you know, but if you're probably dealing with equipment that still has a lot of retained material and biofilm, it just need more time and more exposure to that cycle. Do you have any other education available for viewing online if folks want to learn more? Uh, myself, personally, uh, that's a good question. I, I have done presentations like this. Uh, there is a 3M Healthcare Academy uh, that should be available. Um, there are other uh, sources that are very good from uh, NACME that do very good biofilm 101 uh, presentations to kind of really explain very nicely the roles of biofilm in healthcare settings. Um, and I'd be happy to send you those uh, links after the presentation. Wonderful. And just a quick note for anyone tuned in, this presentation specifically will also be available on demand in about an hour. So if you want to share it with your colleagues, if you want to reference it, if you want to use it, you know, in your department for training purposes, um, that's why we, we make these conferences available on demand after the fact. So you can continue uh, to draw from the information that's shared. All right, we're getting some great questions in. Is there a study about ethylene oxide penetration on biofilms? Not that I am directly aware of. However, if I were probably to go do a Google search, I'm sure I would come across them. And just like any other sterilization cycles, whether if we're talking about gamma radiation, ethylene oxide, steam, um, x-ray, 
uh, it all just really comes down to the original bio load, uh, the bio burden that's present, and uh, additionally, what is the subsequent cycle that is needed to take care of it. Wonderful. And I did see a, um, a comment on a recent post about this conference about the difference between bio burden and biofilm and the relationship between those two things. Can you just address that and what sterile processing techs need to understand about the difference? Sure. And it really just comes down, I guess, how we want to define uh, the terms. And I can understand this comes back to my comment I made about maybe scientists, we don't do a good job of communicating uh, our data and our thoughts all the time. Typically in the realm when we talk about bio burden, it's when we take materials as they are in nature and just try to understand how much bacteria just exists on them just all the time. Uh, whether if it's a raw material or if it's a food source, just what is their, what we call bio burden? How, what is hanging out on them as is? Biofilm really then is a transition into is what is the state that that bio burden is, is in. It, are they just sort of there hanging out as kind of individual cells as a low bio burden or have they evolved more into that biofilm? Now they've started secreting that EPS, building their house and, and try to protect themselves uh, a lot more. All right, thank you for that clarification. Uh, next question, what's a good way to deal with biofilm when we're processing GI endoscopy? Uh, that's a really good question and I'll be fully honest that that's something that I don't have a lot of knowledge in and I'm hoping that there's others that are following me today that will be able to answer that question for you a lot better than what I could. All right, and if folks are interested in tuning in later today to Dr. Weva Truscott's presentation, um, she can certainly uh, touch on that topic as well. So uh, next question, uh, is there any com comparative study between ethylene oxide versus hydrogen peroxide penetration that you know of? Uh, again, not off the top of my head, but I'm sure uh, the manufacturers of those technologies, I'm hoping would have done something. Um, but then again, you know, biofilm isn't something that's routinely done in a lot of laboratories. Uh, it is kind of a niche thing that you find uh, in sort of, you know, in academia or in labs like ours at 3M where we really tend to focus on it. Um, however, you know, I think if I looked hard enough, I probably could find some information. Now, I don't know if it would be a direct head-to-head -head comparison. Um, it may just be an evaluation of each of the technologies individually versus certain types of biofilms. Um, but I agree, I think that would be really nice information. I love head-to-head -head, um, uh, comparison of data, and, and that's typically in my lab when we do that. Uh, and within an individual model, when you rerun it over and over again, it's never the same twice. Uh, so running things side by side uh, comparatively, I think, is always really valuable when you, when you run them in the same experiment. All right, a potential topic for a future Beyond Clean Myth Busting event. We'll see. Yes, <laughs> um, very good. We like those head-to-head -head conversations as well. They're great learning opportunities. Um, okay, next question. Was a paper ever written on the use of probiotics to help prevent biofilms in the dog food processing plant that you mentioned? I don't think so, uh, and I think I think that question was asked of the microbiologist at the conference, and I think it is that sort of unfortunate um, reality of you know industry versus maybe academia, where where maybe in, in industry they don't want people don't always want to reveal their hand. Uh, so while it was a really great observation and she presented some really nice data, unfortunately, not a whole lot was revealed. They, did, they weren't going to reveal what the probiotic was, um, you know, and I understand that, you know, that's intellectual property for particular companies. So unfortunately, I think the answer is no. Okay. Next question. Do you study biofilms at different time points, few hours versus days, and do you test buildup between cycles of, of drying? 
Unfortunately, in my lab, I don't deal with buildup biofilms a whole lot because, as I mentioned, I'm more of a wound care guy. Uh, so typically, the biofilms that we, we deal with are 24 hours to seven days um, we'll grow them for. And we definitely do see differences uh, even just with those traditional biofilms from the different time points. And it really just kind of boils down to the type of model that you're running as well. Um, a model where you're going to run it on the bench, you can get a really thick, robust biofilm in 24 hours, and it really doesn't change a whole lot um, from a physical structure over time, but uh, metabolically it's changing over time. And then depending on what the therapeutic is that you're testing and how it's going to react, it can be varied. Um, but then once you get out to seven days, you know, then you start depending on what the biofilm is grown on, you can start to really see uh, differences as well. And then it also boils down to, are you running single species biofilms or polymicrobial uh, um, biofilms as well? They definitely evolve over time. And as I mentioned in the talk is that uh, on one given day uh, with one set of uh, organisms, you, prop, you can get one set of data, but then you swap out one or two organisms and you take the exact same treatment and you get a completely different set of data. That happens over time as well. Uh, it would be really interesting to see um, from the, the buildup biofilm standpoint uh, how that does uh, go over time. Unfortunately, I, I just don't have that data. Okay. And the Beyond Clean team can certainly explore um, throughout the, the community of subject matter experts to see if we can address that specific topic. But thank you for sharing the information from a wound care standpoint. All right. Next question. If water feeds the biofilm on medical instruments that are stored, those instruments are not properly dried. That is something that is happening and can cause cross-contamination for nosocomial infections. What can be done for a solution? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not very familiar, like, what is the typical process of when the instruments are coming out of the OR and, and how they are. I mean, I imagine they're in containers or baskets as they're being transferred to central sterilization. And I don't know if uh, chemical solutions are anything that is employed along the way. It would make sense that even if it's a solution that may not necessarily kill or break down that biofilm, but if it's something that could at least put it into some sort of stasis to prevent it from wanting to proliferate um, in that timing between uh, OR to the transfer to central sterilization, I think that would be a good idea. Um, but again, it's not my area of expertise per se. Um, and again, it all probably boils down to what would be a good solution and its compatibility with the instruments as well. Um, couple that with the fact of the cost um, and that that probably adds into your, uh, your processing uh, life cycle. Um, and then what you have to do to deal with if you're adding chemicals, uh, then what do you have to do with that when it gets to central sterilization? Will you need a separate waste stream to deal with it? Because it may be something that can't go down the drain. A lot of uh, probably really important things to consider if that seems, um, if it's appropriate uh, and really worth it. Um, if your cycle is pretty timely, maybe it's not something that's necessary, but if you're more concerned, uh, if it's, especially if it's very dirty surgeries, bowel surgeries per chance, maybe it's something that's absolutely appropriate. Okay, and we do have some information coming up later today about pre-treatment of instruments. Um, and so Fantastic. we'll get we'll into that subject. So Yeah, we'll yeah. leave it to the experts. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, what are some examples of the technologies used to... Oh, I already asked that one. Sorry about that. If antimicrobial and high-level disinfectants can't impact biofilm completely, is the best method then manual cleaning action and terminal sterilization? Absolutely. And, you know, and it kind of comes down to that cereal bowl example uh, that I gave to, you know, and, it, and we even talk about this a lot just in the pandemic, you know, like one of your best defenses that you have right now are, are the physical uh, things that you can do, whether it's wearing a mask or just basic hand washing. So if you just do really good hand washing soap and water, you can really do a, go a long way of reducing uh contamination and transmissibility events and such. So I, I would think that probably 
you know, that first line of defense of just really good cleaning and timely cleaning. I think that timely cleaning, as I described about those drying events and the buildup biofilm are, are really important. Okay, wonderful. I do have one more question. If I'm interested to learn more about biofilm and its impact on medical device reprocessing, where do I go to find more information on this topic? So there are very good articles available. Again, if, if you if you want to go ahead and search uh, the web, there are some open source articles. There's some really good uh, articles put together by, I believe, Roberts that uh, summarize several into one to kind of come up with a, a sort of a cons not consensus, but a, a summary of a lot of the work that and thoughts that have been out there. That is, I think, a really good place to start. And then there's uh, some more information, more basic, uh, well, not basic, but some really good information by, I believe her name is Michelle Alpha, that's available online as well, uh, that does a really nice job of describing biofilm more directly uh, in its relationship with uh, reprocessing. Okay, great. I did have another question sneak through. Um, in your experience as a microbiologist, what has been the most helpful way to learn about and to teach this type of information, even at the most basic level? Uh, I, I think it would be, you know, things like that, like we just did today. Uh, you just find uh, somebody who's willing to communicate essentially that kind of real ground level data and not dive too deep um, and to say specifically, this is what my product does, or um, this is specifically the one thing I looked at, like the metabolic path pathway of this or organism is affected by this, um, you know, solution or something like that. It, it, it's really, um, you know, the, the Centers for Biofilm Engineering at Montana State have resources on their website that, I, that would be a great place to go and look. And as I mentioned, there are some really good uh, sort of uh, articles that have been put together by some folks that essentially, you know, like, sorry for lack of the better term, is some biofilm for, for dummies or some biofilm 101 that are really great places to start. Okay, great. And another question just came through. We do have a couple more minutes. So if you have a last minute question that you want to send through, please do so. We've got about three minutes remaining in this session. This question says ultrasonic and the Ultrasonicing the instruments and manual cleaning should break up biofilm, correct? Yes, we actually use ultrasonic water baths in the recovery of our bio biofilms when we do our testing. It is, it's a very good uh, part of the process. It's not the ultimate and only process, but it is definitely a piece of the puzzle that does work very well, uh, at least getting it um, maybe not necessarily doesn't break the biofilm bonds that I discussed a little bit up, but it does a good job of starting to uh, get it off of the surfaces and then make it more available uh, to follow up treatments. And a follow up question <clears throat> for folks who do clean ver cleaning verification tests. If an instrument has biofilm on it, is the potential for those tests to show more and more uh, more and more substance in the instrument as you break up those layers of biofilm. Yeah, it's it's possible, uh, you know, and that kind of goes back to that slide where I did the micro one and we talk about, you know, colony forming units and, and it is something that we deal with in, in general microbiology. Um, Staph aureus, for example, is a is an organism that loves the clumps. Uh, you know, so Staphylococcus, I mean, that's essentially what that Latin term means is, it, you know, you get clusters of grape-like structures of these organisms. So the more that I break those clusters up and then do the back end counting of that, I will get more and more CFUs the more and more I break those clusters up. And it would be similar for that biofilm as well. Um, but, you know, we do, like I said, we do measure logarithmically. So it, it does take quite a bit, um, you know, orders of magnitude, 10 times more of that material to pop up to really to make a noticeable difference in your count. Okay, great. Uh, we do have time for one more question. Has the Lubach method ever been used to develop biofilms to study medical device reprocessing specifically? 
Not that I have, uh, not that I know of. That was purely speculation on my part, where I think, you know, there's been a lot of great work that's been done in certain areas. You know, so for example, we've taken methods that have been used in the industrial side and modified them to be able to use them for evaluating wound care dressings. Uh, so I was sort of just flipping it on its head a little bit and taking one that was specifically developed for a wound care standpoint and seeing if it could be used um, potentially in other areas, especially like a device reprocessing. Uh, I was just me just being a scientist and just kind of playing around, I guess. We appreciate that about you. <laughs> All right, Joseph, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your expertise with our audience. Um, Everyone who is tuned in after each session ends, you will automatically be redirected to the following session in the conference if you simply just keep your browser window open. Uh, there's a 15 minute break built into each, in between each session. So if you do have to leave the event and come back, you should have received an email this morning with the access links to each of the sessions along with the start time. So you can simply use those access links uh, whenever you'd like. Uh, up next, we will hear from Dr. Akash Agarwal about biofilms and in implants. And we will see everyone in about 15 minutes. <laughs>